Good morning, church. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I invite you to go ahead and take it out. Our scripture reader today is going to come from the book of Colossians, chapter 2, and verse 6. Today we are bringing to a close our series on the reflections on the good news. And uh, I want you to know it has been very wonderful me, for me as your preacher, and I hope it has been wonderful for you as the congregation to simply dwell on the various aspects of the good news of Jesus Christ and what he means for us as those who are in him. Today, we are going to add one last element to our reflections. We're going to talk about how Christ is sufficient to our every need. But I don't want to say too much on the front end. I want to leave it for after our scripture reading. So I hope by now you've had a moment to turn to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. And if you, if you have, I'd like to just read beginning in verse 6 and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. It is kind of a long reading, but um, uh, we need to catch it all in order to get the point that he's making here today. So begin reading with me, if you will, in Colossians chapter 2. In verse 6, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends upon human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Now, if you, if you like to highlight in your Bible, you want to notice especially verses 9 and 10, which will be central for today. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is head over every power, and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision that is done by Christ himself, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, or a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So do not let anyone who delights in false humility and who in the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. But he's lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world. Why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Rules like, do not handle, do not taste, and do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they're based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but in fact they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Now that I have been preaching for you for, according to Eric, seven years, but it's really just five, okay, uh, <coughs> you have certainly learned about me that one of the things that I am most grateful for in my spiritual life 
was the discovery and the use of spiritual disciplines. As I have told you all before, this was not something that I had a lot of teaching on whenever I was growing up in the church. And so when it came to my battle with sin in my early years, I primarily relied upon willpower to overcome my bad and evil habits. And by the way, I was not largely successful in that endeavor. Willpower can take you so far. Uh, Social pressure from the group can take you even farther. But one eventually comes to learn that nothing less than a real change of heart is going to win the battle against sin. And we simply do not have direct access to the places in our heart to make that kind of change within ourselves. That is a work that only God can do. Spiritual disciplines, whenever they are best understood, are understood as a means of willingly submitting our mind and our body before God through practices of prayer and Bible reading and fellowship and silence and submission and giving and solitude and fasting and other things like those, we learn to submit ourselves through bodily actions and through mental actions, and that then opens up room for the Holy Spirit to come in and do that heart-changing work. And once I learned how this operated and put it into practice, Sure enough, I found out that what they said would happen really does happen. God began to move in and to change my heart in ways that I simply could have never done or anticipated on my own. So to say that I am grateful for the knowledge and the practice of spiritual disciplines, that would be an understatement to say the least here this morning. But even as I acknowledge that, and I do try to promote it among you from time to time, I also do so with a little bit of trepidation. And the reason I have that trepidation is because there is also a danger in regard to spiritual disciplines. And this really should come as no surprise to us because guess what? All of the best things in life, they are dangerous. Something that's really good, only something that's really good can be corrupted and made thoroughly bad. For example, patriotism is a wonderful thing, but if you twist it in the wrong way, it can be a terrible monster. Sex is among the the highest of human experiences, and yet if you abuse it, it can be very dangerous. Food is among our most robust pleasures, but again, it can become very dangerous to our health if not respected. Vegetables are very dangerous, don't you know this? This is true of every good thing. Okay, and the spiritual disciplines are no different. So why is there a danger in regard to spiritual practices? The danger is this. The danger is thinking that the power is in the practice itself. As if prolonged times of silence or long periods of fasting or intense periods of Bible study alone can make the necessary changes for the human heart to flourish. If you really believe that is the case, all you have to do is put those things into practice by themselves and you'll find they won't produce anything. As a matter of fact, they actually might produce something. The worst of all things, actually, pride. Pride is terrible in any kind of life, any part of life, but spiritual pride is the absolute worst. Well, what is true of the spiritual disciplines is true of almost every aspect of the spiritual life. If we take Christ and we add anything to him and say that this is absolutely necessary to our life in God, then we fail to recognize where the true power lies. The power has always lined with Christ and Christ alone. Anything else that we use or anything else that we have as a way of opening ourselves is really just to give us access to the the real treasure. And the real treasure is nothing less than Christ himself. That message is very important, and the reason that I raise it to your attention here this morning is because that is the primary message of the book of Colossians. Now, we don't have time for a full background of the letter here this morning, but in the book of Colossians, Paul is writing to a church that he did not plant and for whom he is not the primary teacher. 
the church was planted by this man named Epaphroditus, who apparently was someone that Paul met while teaching in the school of Tyrannus during his two-year stay in Ephesus. But just like the churches that Paul did plant, early problems began to arise in this congregation. By the way, it's important to understand this always happens. We might wish for a time when the church was not facing any kind of challenges or when it was not having to fight to contend for the faith. But I'll just tell you right now, such a time never exists. Okay, These churches in the early first century, no more did they get established and get themselves off the ground than boom, opponents enter in either from without or more often than not from within. Now, we're all aware of the problem that Paul, that Paul placed in most of, faced in most of his churches, and that was this Jewish controversy about whether or not you had to keep the law in order to be saved. That problem that developed among a lot of Paul's churches has echoes here in Colossae. So Colossae is no different from these first century churches in this regard, but it does appear that Colossae has its own unique kind of heresy that developed. Yes, it was a little bit of Jewish legalism, but there were also hints of oppressive asceticism and perhaps angelic mysticism. That's a lot of, a lot of isms for one sentence, I understand that, but hopefully as we read our text here this morning, you'll be able to see this a little more fully. But first, I want you to notice the idea of where it all begins here in the middle of the book of Colossians. Paul starts his whole line of thinking with a proclamation in verse 6, if your Bible's still open. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness." This is Paul's general encouragement in the book of Colossians. Just as you originally received Christ and first came to believe in Him, continue your life in Him. Find your root in Him. Be built up in Him. Find strength in the faith that you were originally taught. That's the positive side of what Paul wants to say in this letter. But he is also going to state it in the negative. If the positive is to continue into Christ, to be rooted and to be built up in Him, then here is the negative side, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends upon human tradition and the basic principles of this world. The question that we raise here is this, what is this philosophy that Paul does not want them to be deceived by. Now, we have to be careful with this word philosophy because it can mean different things in different contexts. The word philosophy simply means a love of wisdom. And certainly I don't think Paul or anyone else in the Bible for that matter would say that there's anything wrong with a love for wisdom. And there is a whole genre of literature that comes from this kind of love of wisdom, and it is known as philosophy. And so in the ancient world, you get writings from men like Plato and Aristotle and the teachings of Socrates. Or maybe in more modern times, you have Immanuel Kant or Jean-Paul Sartre and, and, and others like them who write in this genre. <clears throat> and so the question is, is this the philosophy that Paul is warning against? And generally speaking, the answer to that is no. This is not what Paul had in mind when he wrote this letter. Paul knew the writings of the philosophers of his time. He even quoted from them when he needed to, when he was in the city of Athens, which is the city of philosophy. So when Paul warns against hollow and deceptive philosophy, it could include some elements of what we might call classical philosophy. But that's not really what he has in mind <clears throat> as he's writing the church here in Colossae. Now what Paul has in mind is something specific that developed in this ancient city. There was an alternative form of religion that was cropping up among this church and it was threatening the integrity of the teaching of the gospel. 
And we don't know exactly what that teaching was, but we can discern by what Paul says about it what some of the elements were that were involved in this teaching. For example, look at verse 16 if your Bible's still open. He says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, or new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Here we are actually seeing signs of what afflicted almost all the churches that Paul was involved with in his early ministry career. Because many of the people who first came in to believe in Christ were also Jewish people who had lived under the regulations of the Old Covenant, they tried to bring their old practices with them into the New Covenant. And worse than that, they tried to say, especially to the Gentiles, it is absolutely necessary for you to keep these regulations if you're going to be saved in Christ. Now, there was nothing wrong with the religious festivals. There was nothing wrong with all the regulations of the Old Testament. They had their place. And on top of that, I don't think Paul would have even minded if people wanted to keep them on their own to a certain extent. If you want to keep the Sabbath, fine, go ahead and keep the Sabbath. If you want to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, great, take your family, camp out in a tent for a week. That's a wonderful thing to do. But what Paul would have had a problem with is binding them on people as a necessity of faith. That was one step too far. And that's true not only of the Jewish rituals, but it could be true of any tradition that we develop that falls outside of the explicit practices of worship that are taught in the New Testament. A second piece of the problem shows up in verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he's seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. If the last threat fell under the idea of unnecessary religious rituals, here we might label this dangerous mystical experiences. Now, in every form of the faith, there is a mystical side. We should not be surprised by that because as human beings, we recognize we are complex individuals and there is, to some degree, a great mystery to who we are in our interior life. And for those of us who have learned to practice a little bit of silence or solitude in our devotional life, we realize that when a person gets quiet before the Lord for extended periods of time, suddenly things start to, to bubble up. Things that we didn't know were there. Things that need to be brought to the surface. That's a good thing, actually. It's something that God uses to reveal to us the, the wounds within us that need his healing touch and his presence. But as I was saying earlier, as with any healthy thing, it can also be twisted. And rather than simply learning that there is a great mystery to our interior being, some let it, let it develop into complete forms of silliness. Sometimes they think they see visions. Sometimes they think they encounter spiritual beings like angels and demons. And perhaps they do. Let's recognize we're not the only creatures in the universe and perhaps some find ways of crossing that divide somehow. But the danger comes when we begin to trust in those subjective experiences more than we trust what is objective and true, like the teaching of Scripture, for example. And so Paul says people will go into great detail about these visions that they've seen, and their unspiritual minds will puff them up with all kinds of notions about things. They will always say, we have a superior wisdom. We have a superior insight into things. And this person becomes a danger not only to themselves, but to all those who are vulnerable within the congregation. Paul lists one more danger before he wraps up his thought. Verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world... Why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? 
Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Those are some examples of the rules. But these are all destined to perish with use. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So if Paul's first risk that he identifies might be called unnecessary religious ritual, and his second risk might be called dangerous mystical experiences, this last one we might call excessive ascetical practices. Say that five times fast, I dare you. Now, we have to be careful with this one because is there some place in the church for disciplined ascetical practices? And the answer is yes. Uh, first of all, in case you don't know the word asceticism, asceticism simply means a strict kind of self-denial in order to enrich your spiritual life. Is there room for that in the life of the Christian? You better believe that there is. Okay, Fasting is an ascetic practice. Periods of silence and solitude are ascetic practices. Prolonged prayer or Bible reading or even generous giving to others, those are all forms of self-denial and ascetic practice. So there is absolutely room in the devotional life for this kind of thing for a Christian. They fit under those spiritual disciplines that I mentioned at the beginning. But what Paul is talking about here is needless rules. Rules that say you shouldn't eat this or you shouldn't drink that. Those are just two examples. But you can look throughout the history of the church and you can find all sorts of excessive practices like the monks who used to live only on bread and water, or the one who threw himself into a, a briar of thorns in order to tame his lust. Unfortunately, there are all sorts of examples of these kinds of things. And Paul says they might have the appearance of wisdom, but they really do not restrain our sinful indulgences. Why? Because that comes from the heart. And only God can change the heart. So here are the dangers in Colossae that Paul is having to address in a church that he did not plant and that he never visited personally. But the reason that I walked you through all of that here this morning is so that we could come back to verse 9 and so that you could see the main point that he's trying to make in this passage. The point really only makes sense if you see all of the dangers that he's referring to. But then once you see the dangers, you can come back and you can see the very positive thing that Paul wants to say in all this. Look again in verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. Here, I think, is one of the most beautiful teachings of the New Testament. And nowhere is it expressed quite like this. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity of the Godhead came to dwell in a historical flesh and blood person. It's a great mystery how that could be accomplished, but along with the resurrection, it is the central tenet of the Christian faith that God became a man. And all of God was present in bodily form in Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thing, and it's a beautiful truth. But the other aspect of the truth is this. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity, yes, is present in his body. And you and I are a part of that body as the church, and we are have been given fullness in Christ. And what does that mean practically? It means that you and I lack nothing that we need in regard to our spiritual life. Everything that we need for life and godliness has been given to us in Christ. And every resource is available to us. The Bible confirms this not only Colossians, but also in several other places. 
In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul says something similar. He says that the Father has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Peter confirms this in his letter in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. His divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him by his, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Now the wording may be a little bit different in each case, but the teaching is exactly the same. You lack nothing that you need for the life that God has called you to. All the resources are yours in Christ. And you have fullness in Christ. And that's something important for us to bear in mind because we live among religious hucksters. There is no lack of people who will come along and say, come follow me, I have the secret to life in God. But if you will notice about such people, they're never sailing Christ alone. It's always Christ plus something else. Perhaps it's a special religious ritual or a promise of mystical experiences or even a, a, a teaching for you to deny the things that God has given you to enjoy. Those are just three possibilities. There are probably hundreds more. But the good news that I am ending this series on here today is that while any number of things might be helpful to you in your spiritual life, you only need one thing, one person, that is. All you need is Christ. He's sufficient to your every need. <laughs> In a world of religious hucksters, that is certainly very good news. Let's pray. Father, I don't know why we are so easily taken aside. I think it's because we're desperate to believe that there's some secret, some shortcut to life in you. When really the truth is that everything that is needed has already been provided by you. And yes, it may be a long journey from a life of sin to a life of holiness but that's the journey that you have slowly set us upon and you have given us every resource we need. Now, we're not totally passive in the process. We don't just sit back and wait for it to happen. We actively pursue, and you've given us means for doing that, prayer and Bible study, fellowship, giving, times of silence and other things that are helpful. But none of those things in and of themselves have any power. The power resides with you and in your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is only Him, through the working of the Holy Spirit, that can change the human heart and turn it towards true righteousness. And so as we wrap up this series, Father, I pray that you would bring home to everyone who is here in the congregation today that, yes, everything we need, it has been supplied all we have to do is trust in you and avail ourselves of it. And in your time and in your way, you will complete the good work that you began in us. And that is sweet good news to us, Father. And so as we end this series today, I pray that you would bring all of these wonderful truths home to us so that we may glory in the gospel. This is my prayer today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.